Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be hanging out with you guys today. Thank you for joining us. I'm going to start by introducing myself. I'm Caitlin Stone, and I'm a partner at Activist Artist Management, where I'm the lucky manager, Mr. Michael Franti, who's here with us today, as well as our in-house certified health and life coach. Um, based on these credentials, ASCAP decided to give me a microphone today, so I will be your moderator. But uh, I'd like to start by giving a huge shout out to our friends at ASCAP for allowing me to curate this. Um, I was really excited uh, to learn more about ASCAP's wellness program this summer through our very long fr a long time friend, Ms. Loretta. And uh, I've been hosting a weekly wellness series uh, for our team throughout the pandemic and just happy to see that our wellness mission and ASCAP's really aligned. Uh, as a reminder, ASCAP's mission is to support its members every step of the way through the wellness program. That includes providing opportunities, benefits, education to help nurture their members, mind, body, and spirit uh, so they can be their creative best. So just super excited to be able to have this joint session with the ASCAP experience and the ASCAP wellness program today. But I'd like to introduce you to my friends here. Uh, ladies first, we have the amazing Molly Woodall, founder of Woodall Wellness, which provides mindfulness, meditation, and wellness coaching to people and corporations across the world. Uh, Molly has been joining us throughout the pandemic um, on our Wellness Wednesdays, and we've just learned so, so much. So thank you for joining us today. And then next up, we have Ms. Hillary Gleason, the Executive Director at Backline, another incredible team that we've been working with throughout the pandemic. Um, Backline is a 501c3 nonprofit that connects music industry professionals and their families with mental health and wellness resources. Um, personally, one of the coolest things about Backline is they not only provide resources for artists, but also for other folks that work in the music industry, managers, assistants, publishers, agents, and so on. So thanks for being here today, Hillary. Thanks so much for having me. And last but not least, uh, one of my favorite humans in the world and the best client ever, Mr. Michael Franti is with us today. Uh, Michael is an ASCAP singer songwriter, an activist, filmmaker, owner of the amazing boutique and wellness hotel, Sosan Bali in uh, Abud Bali, uh, host of the Stay Human podcast, and may the list go on. We are very busy all the time. So thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you. So instead of this being a roundtable panel where we just answer a bunch of questions, we definitely would like to structure it a little bit differently. Uh, you guys have some amazing tools to offer the ASCAP audience. So we're going to start by uh, focusing on the most simple human need, breathing, um, as well as micro meditating, the importance of movement, of letting go, asking for help, and I'm sure a few more things along the way. But, and of course, we can't invite Michael Franti without having a little bit of music in here as well. So to begin, I'm gonna toss it over to you, Molly, if that's all right. You've just been incredible at leading our team um, and being you know, peaceful and present throughout the pandemic. And I would love for you to just tell us a bit about your journey um, and maybe we can do a little mini session. Yes, yes, yes. Hello, everyone. And gosh, I am so grateful to be here today. And I do think it's the perfect opportunity to kind of take a few moments to settle in with our breath before we, you know, continue talking about what it looks like to care for yourself during, you know, this wild time in our world. So again, my name is Molly Woodhall. I am the founder of a corporate wellness company, and we provide mindfulness and compassion-based meditation for people and companies across the world because we know that there's a lot going on and we need to find realistic and meaningful ways to manage sort of the ebbs and flows of our everyday life. You know, I think really my whole life has sort of brought me to where I am now, there were always two things that I knew to be true. I wanted to run my own biz and I really wanted to be in um, mental health and wellness. And so, you know, my life experiences sort of brought me to do a lot of research in the world of mindfulness and meditation. And what we're really all about at Woodhall Wellness is sort of expanding our awareness of mindfulness and meditation. And instead of maybe, um, you know, what you think of as meditation, 10 minutes of sitting down, you know, legs crossed, maybe we'll change that a little to make micro meditations accessible, which is really just one breath to maybe one minute of thoughtful breathing. 
And so oftentimes when I'm on a panel or teaching in person or Zoom, I think uh, a few thoughtful deep breaths is the perfect way to start. Um, so I thought the micro meditation we could do together is one, it's very simple. We'll just inhale for a count of five. We'll hold at the top of that breath to feel into that sensation of fullness. And then we'll exhale for five. I read this wonderful book called Breathe. And um, a few different scientists have realized that inhaling for five and exhaling for five is really the most productive breath. Um, as we inhale and make that inhale a little more elongated than usual, uh, it awakens the mind, brings oxygen into the body. And by elongating the exhale to by about five seconds, it tells the body to relax, that we're safe and everything's okay. And so matching the inhale and exhale kind of brings us to this space of feeling alert and awake and calm and safe. Sound good? I mean, that sounds pretty good to me. Okay, so all of us are sitting down, wherever you might be, I suggest putting your feet on the ground and then just getting comfortable in your chair. You can lean back if you like, or just stay where you are. And go ahead and close your eyes if that feels comfortable. Feeling your body in the chair beneath you. And take an inhale through the nose, counting to five, four, three, two, one. Hold. Then an exhale for five, four, three, two, one. We'll do one more round, inhaling for five. Holding at the top of the breath and exhaling for five. Letting it all go. And then returning your awareness to the body in the chair. And when you're ready, opening your eyes. And just noticing how you feel. And not immediately letting go of that sense of peace or calm, even just very little. But knowing that it lives within you at every minute of every day. And you can return to this feeling anytime with just one breath. So how do you guys feel? Good? Calm. Yeah. Good. Nice and relaxed. It's kind of amazing how just one breath makes a difference or two. You know what I mean? So true. When you taught us this the first time, I remember the just trying to do five in and hold it. It was it's hard. You know, you really have to focus on that. So I feel like my lung capacity is getting better as we continue to work with you on this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it can be tough. I was reading a book, just one thought really cool. I've been reading a book on the breath. And um, the beginning of it said the breath is the foundation of life. And it said you can live three weeks without food, about you know, three days without water, but only three minutes or three seconds without the breath, you know? It's so important and we just forget um, about how impactful it is to us in our everyday life. Wow, that's super powerful. Thank you, Molly. I'm very fortunate because your uh, meditations micros have become a daily part of my wellness routine since we started working together. So thank you for that. But <laughs> I'd like to segue over to Michael um, as we talk about wellness routines. You know, I've heard, um, I'm so lucky to get to listen in on so many of your interviews and your conversations. And I've heard you say a number of times that during the pandemic, your definition of wellness um, and your wellness routine has changed. I mean, on top of that, you and your family relocated to a completely different country over the last year and a half, which obviously added a lot of changes to your routine. So I would love if you could share a little bit about what wellness looks like to you now and kind of how that's changed throughout the course of the pandemic. Well, when I started really focusing on wellness, I had been touring for you know, 20 years approximately, well, maybe about 15 years. And I felt really worn out. Like I was tired all the time, wasn't eating well. I didn't um, 
feel good in my body. I, I had aches and pains and, and I was in and out of a tour bus airplane. And I went to a yoga class um, on September 12th, 2001. So it was the day after the attacks of September 11th. I was super stressed out. Everybody in the room was too. And uh, kind of like what you just described, Molly, just this feeling of like how you can find stillness and you can find um, relaxation in a short time. At the end of this one hour yoga class, I felt like a different person, you know, and um, and I said, I want more of this. So I started going to yoga every day on tour. I would just find a different yoga school and and um, it became a part of my life. Um, and when the pandemic hit, I was in Bali and my wife and I own a yoga hotel there called Soul Shine Bali and we had just finished leading a retreat and um, I was getting really excited to go out on tour again and then boom everything just collapsed you know and we were there and we had to figure out things differently in our life there was you knew, um, you know, financial concerns, like how are we going to keep this hotel going? There was just the stress of not knowing what was going on in the world with, with, uh, uh, the disease. We both got COVID at one point at the same time, you know, uh, just everything that you could imagine started to come to the surface, um, emotionally during this time. And, I started to think about wellness differently. It wasn't like, just like, am I going to yoga class every now and then? Am I mixing in an organic salad every now and then? Like, am I fitting into my jeans? Like that's as one definition of wellness. Um, and then we see it so much like an Instagram, like, like if you're, if you're, you know, a size, whatever that you're good. And if you go up a size, you're, you're not well anymore. Well, wellness for me became, more about whole health. And what, what I mean by that is that it's not just about um, the food that we eat or the exercise we do, but it's also about our relationships and our social structure. It's about our intellectual wellness. It's about our spiritual growth and spiritual wellness, our emotional well-being, our occupational well-being, um, our financial well-being, our environmental well-being. You know, what's the world that we're living in? as well as like our physical well-being and all those things together are what I think of as whole health. And I think it's important that um, as we move through the, the pandemic, what we once thought is like, um, man, if I'm, if I'm a little bit run down, it's just, you know, I'm not going to be running at full capacity, but now if you're run down, it could fucking kill you. Like we can get, um, disease in our life that can bring our life to an end with COVID and, and who knows what the next pandemic will be. And so it's, it's that, but it's also thinking about how do we show up for our whole health, for the health of our families and our communities and our, and our planet really as a whole. And um, so that's the way I've, I've started to just redefine it as not just about being wellness, being the size of your genes, but, um, wellness being about whole health. Wow, so much to think about and digest there too. So thank you for sharing that. You know, one thing that I know you find to be very therapeutic is being creative. That's what you do best. And um, seeking that we're here with ASCAP, can you talk a little bit about creativity and wellness and just how that kind of has impacted your songwriting during the pandemic? Yeah, well, when we started um quarantining we both went crazy Sarah and I we both started to go a little bit like cuckoo like oh my god when is this gonna end or what are we doing you know and and so and on top of it we had all these different layers of stress and one of the ways that I've always um found to relieve stress in my life is through songwriting and through storytelling and through taking whatever it is that is in my heart and getting it out whether it's the deepest shadowy place of my soul or whether it's the greatest joy in my life and expressing it in words and in music and um i have uh really felt 
an even deeper need to have that kind of processing in my life um, during the quarantine. And I, and I have friends and, and people all around the world who have shared with me the same kind of thing. Like I started painting, I started drawing, I started, you know, you know, doing something online, creating in some way and having a creative outlet is, is a really big part of, of, of being well. And I wrote a ton of songs. And you want to play us one? I'd love to. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you walked right into that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, this is a song that that I wrote. Um, Sara and I were thinking, like, gosh, how are we just going to keep the lights on in our building? You know. Um, and one night we were up, and 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 Sara said to me, you know, my family came to North America from Iran in 1980, and they had two suitcases and seven hundred dollars and a baby. And they were able to somehow make it work and and survive and 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 raise a family. And so it's not just like how are we going to physically keep the lights on in our building, but how are we going to keep the lights on inside here and up here when we go to these really dark places emotionally and feel like weighed down. And so um, I wrote this song about it. It goes like this. get darker the nights get long and i just keep waking up to the same old song and that same voice in my head is always running around oh now the clock tick tock and the whole world stops with the bills i got they just keep on piling up trying to keep up keeping up but it's kind of getting me down see i'm just one in seven billion Trying to keep the lights on Trying to keep the lights on Trying to keep the lights on Keep the lights on well, You and me are the same, you see We got big, big plans and big, big dreams And I'm never gonna let the world ever take them away Oh, now you and me Whole family, we're gonna fill our bus with the love we got in us. Pull it out the driveway and fly it away. See, I'm just one in seven billion. Trying to keep the lights on. I'm trying to keep the lights on. I'm trying to keep the lights on. Keep the lights on. Oh, now dollars turn to dust and I just hope my hope has one more life my heart is broke but I ain't broken now see I'm trying to keep the lights on I'm trying to keep the lights on I'm trying to keep the lights on keep the lights on then I say whoa my heart is heavy but whoa I'm in heaven like, whoa, my heart is heavy, but whoa, I'm in heaven with you. Trying to keep the lights on, trying to keep the lights on, keep the lights on, keep your lights on. Oh, I just love it so much. <laughs> Thank you so much for playing that. Thank you. Hillary, I'm going to come over to you for a few minutes. So um, when we were first introduced to Backline, man, we were pumped over at Activists because there's obviously some incredible organizations out there that we can send our artists to, which is insanely important. But to know that we could come to you guys for ourselves was so great too. So. I would love if you could share a little bit about you know, how you guys got started and what your mission is and just overall some of the services and resources that you guys offer. Yeah, so Backline is a mental health and wellness resource. Um, we serve, as you mentioned, the entirety of the music industry as well as their family members, recognizing that you know each person in this is a valuable part of this ecosystem and that if we can support any one person, it, 
supports the overall health of the industry and of these bands and, and creators that are out there. And so we launched in October, 2019. Um, how we got started was really uh, people sounding the alarm that the music industry was in crisis and that people weren't sure where to go. Um, so in the summer of 2019, there were a few losses in my music community, but you know, the struggles are something that we've experienced for years and years before these conversations started to happen, really go back as long as modern music has been around. Um, so I think it was just a moment of crisis and I actually got five phone calls on one day in the summer of 2019 that were all asking the same question, which is what's going on? Why are people slipping through the cracks? And I think that that is really the origin of Backline is people sounding that alarm and saying, what's going on here? And so we started a series of conference calls with people from all different parts of the industry. We had tour managers and promoters and agents and artists all there. And we also invited some of the incredible organizations that already serve different pieces of this pie. So we had Music Cares on the call and Sweet Relief Musicians Fund. And really we're just trying to have a dialogue where people could you know, hear more about the resources that were available to them and start to have those conversations. And as we were on the call, you know, some of the questions that we were asking was, when someone in your band is struggling, where do you go? Um, and we were asking the organizations, you know, the other side, what resources do you offer and who are they available to? And what became clear was that a bridge was needed between the mental health care space and the music industry. And so that was what we built Backline to be, is this navigator of the mental health space, we understand the landscape. We know the organizations that are active and can serve people, um, but we also understand their eligibility requirements, what they can offer. We have therapists in our network that are offering pro bono sessions. And so anybody in the music industry or their family members can come to us and say, I'm struggling. Mm -hmm. And we say, okay, great. Do you have insurance? Do you have you know, ability to pay, what are you looking for? What have you tried before? How can we create a comprehensive wellness and mental health care plan that is going to meet you where you are? And I think that that is the key here is, you know, in 2019, it was primarily a touring industry. We didn't have a crystal ball at that point to know how important these services were going to be um, moving forward. But it's really about letting people know that no matter where they are in the world, it, it could be in the back seat of a van, um, you know, traveling down the highway on tour, we can help build a plan that works for that experience. Yeah, that's incredible. You know, I asked Michael before we started if I could share, um, when we reached out to you guys, Michael was looking to connect with somebody and within 12 hours, you guys were back to us, had fully connected the dots there. And, and I know that, you know, Michael, you can share a little bit further about your experience with Backline, but you're always right on top of it. We so appreciate it. Yeah. Um, well, you know, the pandemic was, and, the, and quarantining has been a super challenging time for me on an emotional level because you know, one, uh, one big aspect of it is just, I'm spent the last 33 years of my life being a touring musician and performing music out, you know, that's how I earn my living. And it's what I get my deepest sense of, you know, creative satisfaction from is playing live music for people. And when it all came to a screeching halt, you know, we were like, man, how are we going to survive? How are we going to get through this? Is this going to be a year, two years, three years, five years? I don't know. And um as someone who as an adult has battled um depression and anxiety uh all those things became elevated for me and i wasn't sleeping i was it was bummed out a lot of the, the time and and just dealing with a whole many many new layers of stress and then being in uh the relationship with my wife in in close quarters like everything that we had that was in our relationship that was there before that we kind of danced around it was like 
you know, you got to deal with it now, you know, um, for better, or for worse and, and for better really. But at the time it, it was, you know, like pulling scabs off, you know? And so, um, yeah, I, I started working with the counselor, uh, from backline and, um, I mean, the, the best way I can describe it is that as the name says in a, a backline is the line of, is the line of gear that we play. So it's like all the amps and drums and technical stuff behind the scenes for the artist to perform with. And we're only as good as our teams, you know? And if there's some something wrong with your wiring and, and, and the guitar rig, it, it can mess up the whole show for everything else. And, and that's how it is as a, as a person, we all have this like, backstory we have this ways of functioning in the world that serve us and sometimes parts of them are off and we've got to go in there and do that deep work have those hard conversations with ourselves and when we're not able to do it alone we we need a team like people from backline to be able to just get on the phone with and, and talk to and um have someone be able to reflect back to you what you're going through and help find ways through it you know and and so it was super helpful for me during the the darkest moments of my pandemic life to be able to um have someone else there and and i would just say one other thing about it which is and this is just from an artist perspective a lot of times people see an artist on stage or on video or TV or whatever, and they think, man, that person really has their shit together. And, but the, the reality is that artists are just like anybody else. And in many cases, even more sensitive. That's why we do art. It's like, we're, we're, we're in tune with, um, you know, what it is that makes the emotion, um, be put into words or through notes or through the through paint or whatever it is and and many artists suffer from um you know that heightened sense of feeling all the time and uh yet have to go out there or feel the need to go out there and put on this you know this show and and meanwhile everything's not okay and so uh I'm grateful to backline and, 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 uh, um, I don't know if I it really honestly would have got through the pandemic, um, as, as strongly as I have with, without the, the support. So thank you. Thank you for sharing. That's a really powerful testimony to the work that we're doing and really why we built this is like, yeah, you, you can be struggling and there's a, now a safe confidential place to go. And sometimes, you know, people come to us and they don't exactly know what they need, but just to be able to say, I'm struggling. Mm -hmm. um, and, and to have someone that understands sort of the clinical side of that mm -hmm. is the difference. So it gives artists and, and crew somewhere to go. It also gives managers somewhere to escalate conversations that before they may not have known, you know, exactly where to send someone. Um, and so we see it as sort of this overall support system, like no stupid questions, come to us, we'll help you get started on your journey. And I think that's a big piece of it too. Yeah. Absolutely. Hillary, do you mind letting us know how people can get connected and plugged in with you guys? Yeah, everything is on our website, uh, www.backline.care and on social media at backline.care. Um, and we have that case management program, which is sort of your one-on-one -on -one referral system. We also offer support groups that meet online weekly. Um, and we have a suite of wellness partners that offer breath work, yoga, meditation, um, and more for free for anyone in the music industry or their families. Amazing. Molly, we got to get you tapped in over there. <laughs> I know I'm here for you. I'm a resource. <laughs> I feel like you got a little bit more to give us here. Can we go back to breath work for a few moments? Yes, yes, yes. So 
Gosh, I'm totally inspired by this conversation. And I, I feel so connected to everything both Michael and Hillary are saying, um, having starting the conversation around mental health and wellness is so freaking important. So the fact that you're doing that is amazing. And then to have Michael share that experience is so powerful because really we're not alone in our suffering. It is a part of life, you know, both joy and health and happiness live in alignment with sadness and suffering. They're all part of it. And so, um, you know, I want to give in this session some tools to help whoever's listening, if they're feeling down or ungrounded, you know, a way to feel joyful, a little bit more grounded, a little bit more calm without really having to create space for a lot of new routines. Um, So something I talk a lot about is joyful routines. What is something in your day that you do each day pretty much that brings you joy? For some of us, it could be writing songs for Michael, you know, or getting creative and playing an instrument. It could be gardening or using your hands. You know, obviously a lot of creatives here. For me, I love to make my morning coffee. And if we're going back to connect this to mindfulness and meditation, Meditation is just the practice of focusing on one thing at a time, noticing when our mind wanders and bringing our awareness back. So that means anything you choose to focus on can be a meditation. And I want all of us to feel empowered that we can pick something we love and focus all of our awareness on that activity for a few minutes a day. And that can be our meditation. Notice when your mind wanders away from that activity, whatever it might be, singing, writing a song, playing an instrument, and bring your awareness back. And each time we do this, we start to build that mindfulness muscle. And we we get just simply more familiar with focusing on one thing at a time and just being here now. I call this joyful routines because it's a way to literally enjoy something that's simple and easy in your everyday life and make it into a routine that's totally simple and all of us can do it meditation is about finding peace and relaxation but it's also about seeking the joy of being alive and there are beautiful you know miracles in the mundane moments throughout our lives that we tend to miss because we're going really quickly And then one other wonderful part of this joyful routine exercise is that, so I'll give myself as as an example, I'll wake up in the morning and I go downstairs and I, you know, I grind the beans and I smell the aroma. I start to boil the water. This whole, this whole experience takes between five and seven minutes total. And I let my phone sit down. I don't really like, I'm not on tech. I'm just present with myself and my coffee and that joyful routine. And sometimes that sort of quiet spaciousness of just doing one thing at a time gives me insight into how my body, heart, and mind are feeling that day. If I went straight to my emails or straight to a meeting, uh, I wouldn't get the opportunity to notice sort of where my mind is wandering or if I'm feeling the extra tightness you know, in my body or in my chest. And so taking a moment to do something you love also gives you the spaciousness to be aware of how you're actually feeling. And with that comes power, you know, so that you know how to step into the rest of the day. Um, My one last thought here is that oftentimes when I do notice my mind wandering and going quickly as I make my coffee, I just simply say, be here now. Be here now just give myself that permission to be present that's my little tidbit that's awesome definitely practice that all the time since you've taught us that and uh, thank you for sharing again you're welcome um mr michael one thing that i know you've really focused on during the pandemic is letting go And I personally see it as letting go of that which is no longer for you. 
um, an insanely powerful tool that I know that all of us on this call could definitely speak to. So I'd love to just kind of hear your thoughts about some of the things that you've been able to let go of and um, the power you feel that that really harnesses. You know, when I first started practicing yoga, I had this really powerful experience. This, this teacher came to me, his name is Eddie Modestini, and he was, um, he just came to me on tour through a friend and he and I would practice wherever we were. And this is right when I was first practicing yoga uh, and my body was really stiff and I was in really, you know, like I could barely touch my toes. And so we would just roll out our yoga mats in the parking lot or in the backstage of the venue or wherever we could. And so this one day we're in this hotel, um, like conference room and Eddie says, I want you to get into Baddha Konasana, which is when you put the heels of your feet together and then you splay them out and then your knees go out like this, you know, and at the time my knees were like up near my shoulders. <laughs> I was like this and, and Eddie um, says, all right, Michael, this is something I want you to learn about your practice. The pose begins when you want to get out of it. That's when it starts. So I was like, I already wanted to get out of this pose. I'm like five seconds in my mind is like going nuts. And so Eddie says, I just want you to sit with it and be with it. And like what Molly was saying, like, just, just breathe, just breathe. So I'm breathing and I'm, I'm just hurting and aching. And I, I just, I just kind of like, I kind of give up and I'm like, Eddie, man, I, I, I can't do like, I don't even know if yoga is the thing for me. Like I can't really say working for me. And he says, well, what's the story that you're telling yourself or the story that's in your head? And I'm, and he, and I go, I don't know. I don't, he just, just close your eyes. Just breathe. Give me like five more breaths and just listen to what's there. And, and I start saying, and I, I just hear like everybody in my life, he told me I wasn't good at anything. You know, like my dad's telling me, you, why can't you hit a baseball? My math teacher's telling me you're never going to be good at math. You know, the counselor in high school saying you're never going to go on to be anything. And and as I'd say all this stuff, I start crying, you know, and as I start to cry, I just feel my knees just go whoosh and like open up and I, and I open up my eyes and my knees had moved about a quarter of an inch, <laughs> like two millimeters, like, and, and Eddie goes, see this is it like this is this is your practice this is your thing it's like to be able to put yourself into these places that are uncomfortable positions and to breathe into it and just sit with it and see what comes up and then give voice to it you know either to me or to yourself to a friend or to god or to what whoever but like just to give voice to whatever's coming up in your life and um and that's been my journey as a yogi. It's been my journey as a parent. It's been my journey as a husband. It's been my journey as a musician, as someone who's out there every day trying to um, just share little bits of my truth with, with other people in hopes that they recognize or, or, or identify with it and go, you know, there's part of me that's kind of like that too. And I'm, I don't feel so alone in the world. And um, yeah, that's, that's my journey in this. We've been hearing a lot about letting go this year too. I think it really speaks to sort of the experience that we've all collectively had over the past 18 months. It's like, let go of your expectations, let go of your plans and just be. And, and there's something to be said for learning to, to do that. You know, you still have goals and you still have hopes and dreams and all of those things, but the rigorous expectations that we can put on ourselves or the, I don't like this feeling of uncomfortability is something that I think we've all been learning to let go of and is a really powerful practice that will serve us in the rest of our journeys. Yeah. Totally. And I think, you know, it can be scary to recognize it's easier to kind of just ignore and suppress sometimes because in order to release and let go, we have to, stand up to or notice, you know, whatever's going on inside. And so, but the reality is that 
even though that's scary, we can all do it. You're not alone. And just as, you know, Michael shared in, in that experience, you allowed yourself to kind of feel some of that heartache, but it gave you then the freedom to actually let it go. And then you don't, it's not living within the body, heart, and mind anymore because it's almost like you released it. Yeah, and the pandemic gave us all so much time to sit with ourselves and our thoughts and our traumas and our triggers and then threw us into this essentially a pressure cooker of where all those things were being activated. So I think there was a personally, and, and Michael, you and I have talked about this, just um, a lot of clarity of the things that weren't for us anymore, that we had time to let go of and bad habits. This has gone on so long that we've had time to create new habits as well. So thank you guys all for sharing. Thanks for having us. I'm so excited. I'm actually <laughs> totally inspired by this. I love that. Um, okay, before we wrap up, uh, I would love for each of you to give the ASCAP audience um, one thought that you have on wellness, being your better self, um, anything along those lines. But before you do it, so I took this amazing 17-week uh, leadership intensive recently with our business coach. And um, during the sessions, a lot of times we had to answer things in one breath, which meant that we were bringing the breath work in, but also bringing focused thinking. And for somebody that can ramble, this was a very hard exercise. So I want to challenge you guys to do it. Um, take a deep breath and whatever you can get out in one breath, your wisdom that you want to share with the world. Molly, you want to go first? Sure. Okay, I can do this. Take a deep <laughs> My encouragement is that all will be well and feel empowered that one breath makes a difference. Amazing. <laughs> Hillary. Okay. Move with intention. Move your body, move through your life, move your relationships with intention. Love that. Nice. My turn. <laughs> All right. My wife and I have a family motto and it's be your best, not the best, but be your best and serve the greater good and rock out wherever you are. Yes. <laughs> Can we rock out before we wrap up? Yeah, yeah. And I want to hear yours. Oh, Hillary, good job. Good job. Um, is it so awful if I steal something <clears throat> my Michael says that's insanely impactful? No. There is no one you wouldn't love if you knew their story. Yeah. That's awesome. I'm glad I asked. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, <clears throat> this is song, another song that I wrote re recently because uh, I was thinking about uh, being alone. The pandemic was something that um, highlighted this for me, the, the difference between being alone and being okay with it and feeling lonely because a lot of us feel lonely when we're in crowds of people or even when we're in our families. And... Um, so this song is about uh, trying to find ways of connection, even when we feel like we're the only people in the world who feel the way that we do. Nobody gets out pain free. Nobody doesn't get along. I used to think that maybe I was the only one, I was the only one, but nobody doesn't get a broken heart, and nobody doesn't need a brand new start, everybody cries on the shoulder sometimes, drunk on a Saturday night, and that's how life reminds us we were alive, that's how life reminds us we were alive, that's how life reminds us we were alive. 
Cause everybody's born with a big, big dream That you make and you break Till your heart stops beating That's how life reminds us We're alive Nobody finds a perfect lover No magic in a four-leaf clover But even through the stormy weather I'll be the one for you I'll be the one for you Cause nobody doesn't need a friend to believe them And nobody doesn't have a friend who leaves them So raise your glass for no freaking reason Drunk on a Saturday night That's how life reminds us we're alive That's how life reminds us we're alive That's how life reminds us we're alive Everybody's born with a big, big dream that you make and you break till your heart stops beating. That's how life reminds us we're alive. So take the big hits when you feel them. Your heart's wide open for all the big feelings. Take the big hits when you feel them. Your heart's wide open for all the big feelings. So raise a glass to the friends you believe in. Raise a glass to your friends who are leaving. Raise a glass for no fucking reason. Drunk on a Saturday night. That's how life reminds us we were alive. 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 That's how life reminds us we're alive That's how life reminds us we're alive Cause everybody's born with a big, big dream That you make and you break Till your heart stops beating And that's how life reminds us we're alive oh. <laughs> So, so, so good. Thank you guys again so much for joining us. And thanks ASCAP team, especially Nicole and Loretta for having us here today. Please follow and support these amazing humans. All their information is going to be on the screen shortly. And uh, that's a wrap, y'all.